welcome to to you all. Um, some of you are typing already, but do let me know where where you are uh, today. We've got Lith Lithuania. Okay, fantastic. Peru, Portugal, Thailand. Good. A very uh, multicultural uh, bunch. Uh, there will be a slight link actually to sort of multi sort of culturalism and. Um, uh, intercultural sort of competence uh, with today's session uh, and we're going to have a look at something called uh, global uh, global skills um, it'll be a chance for you guys to uh, to ask some questions um, I've also got some questions for you I would love to hear uh, from you uh, your opinions uh, from your teaching uh, contexts uh, as well so we'll work through some maybe some core um, some core questions. Uh, if you do have your own questions, feel free to uh, to jump in um, to uh, the uh, chat box. We'll mainly focus on um, kind of the what. You know, what are, what are uh, global skills? What is the the relevance maybe in in current uh, educational uh, contexts? And then most importantly, the the how. How can we start uh, integrating them, or developing, or extending, expanding them uh, in our uh, in our classrooms? I also want to touch on assessment as well. Is it something? Our global skills are they something that can be uh, assessed, um, or should they should they be assessed? So it'd be great to get your uh, opinion as uh, as well. Um, quick question to you guys before we get started. Will you let me know what um, segment you're teaching? So are you a uh, pre-primary, primary? Are you teaching teens? Are you teaching young adults? Business English? What are you, what are you teaching? Just give me a snapshot and that'll help me as well. I'm sure we've got a real, uh, a real mix. Loads of teens, adults. Okay. All right. Fantastic. All right, and I we've I can see some uh, some questions coming in um, as well as as we go. Right, thank you very uh, very much. I think what we'll try and do um, first is get a snapshot of uh, what global uh, skills uh, really really are. So it'll be good to get your uh, your opinion uh, on on that. So what what would you say? Um, maybe each of you can have uh, one one skill. What are global skills? Can you write? So what are some of your ideas? Can you write some in the chat box? What do you think are some global skills? Let's define them before we go uh, any uh, any further. What do you think? What are global skills? And I will try and keep up. Critical thinking, communication, acceptance, effective listening, intercultural, okay. Accept, lots of acceptance, okay. Analytical thinking, computing, uh, ethics, understanding, all right. Yeah, what, was, what I'll try and do, I think what these do is they kind of fall under some um, key or maybe sort of four or five different um, umbrellas okay good someone said life skills as well life skills 21st century skills and we can discuss as well are global skills 21st century skills are they life skills or something a little bit different and we'll discuss that as we uh, as we go through okay some great great ideas there let's have a look and see what I have. Let me just shift on a little bit. Right. So many of you have have mentioned, and um, and many of you would know. Obviously, we know about the, the 21st century skills: our communication, collaboration, our critical thinking, our, our creativity, and they are certainly still part of uh, global uh, global skills. Um, it's not. It's not new. I mean. Many of these aspects are not new, right? They're not new concepts. And you, as teachers, I'm sure, have been uh, integrating these such skills into your classrooms for uh, a, a long period. Uh, even when uh, 
uh, when I was studying at school, I'm sure we were covering a lot of these aspects as well. So they're not new concepts. But what I, I love are these kind of more modern 21st um, editions here. So we've got this intercultural competence and citizenship. I love that. We had a talk uh, already this week about global citizenship. So some crossover, crossover there. The intercultural part, wonderful. I think our world is becoming much smaller, right? Um, we're meeting uh, many more people from, from different parts of the world. Uh, I work in a, in a global office. We have offices in over um, 50, 50 countries. It's, a, it's an amazing experience, um, but also challenging as well when you work with, uh, with different uh, cultures. Global village, absolutely. Um, that is the correct way, isn't it, to, to describe it. Um, and also what I love, uh, this second one in blue here, we've got the emotional self-regulation. So many of you have been talking about that with your ideas in, in the chat box there and well-being. And that's so important right now, isn't it? Um, and I think that can be split up. We've got things like socio-emotional learning, uh, how we regulate uh, our own emotions, how we understand uh, other people's emotions. Many of you wrote empathy uh, in the chat box there uh, as well, which would all kind of come under that uh, um, umbrella of emotional self-regulation and well-being. Uh, we can go on and have a little bit of a look, a deeper look at um, socio-emotional learning and how we would integrate that into our uh, courses as well uh, a little bit later. And finally, of course, we have the digital literacies, maybe not so uh, relevant uh, when I was studying. So I did my exams, uh, my, my GCSEs in, in the UK, I think back in uh, 1996, 1997, um, I think I was at my levels. But we were still writing. We weren't using computers back then, uh, where, where I wasn't anyway, so it wasn't important. So. I think for many of us now as, as teachers, we're trying to catch up with our students, right? Um, in terms of digital uh, literacy. So what we will talk about today as well is not only developing these skills for our students, but I think as teachers, we also need to develop those skills, uh, the knowledge, even the attitude uh, as well, um, for teaching global skills to try and try and keep up and stay relevant uh, ourselves uh, as uh, as well. So let's use yeah let's use these key areas as our starting point today. I think all the skills that you gave me, I, I think they would fall under uh, these kinds of categories. And if you have any questions about these uh, specific maybe five umbrella categories. Uh, please feel free to write uh, any questions in the chat box. Our team will pick up on those. If I miss them, they'll pick up on them and I, I, will, I will do my best um, to uh, answer as, as many as I, uh, as I can. Um, where, where have I got these skills uh, from, you may ask? And it may be of interest um, to you. Um, I got these actually from a mixture of different places. So um, there are different frameworks that we see now around the world being used in different educational um, systems in different countries. So you might find some, um, some countries uh, may use, there's a UNESCO. Some of you may have heard of the UNESCO for four pillars uh, frame, uh, framework. Um, so they're looking at things, I've got it here, they're looking at the yeah, learning to know, learning to do, uh, learning to live together, uh, learning to be, okay? So some, uh, some countries within inside their national educational frameworks may adopt those four, um, four pillars. Um, and some of those areas obviously interlink uh, with the ones on, uh, on the screen. Um, what else do we have? We also have the framework for 21st century uh, learning uh, as well. So these, they look at areas like ways of thinking, uh, what else? Tools for working, ways of working, uh, ways of living in the world. Um, so, so different educational systems may draw on these different uh, frameworks. 
But when you summarize all these frameworks, um, these are kind of the five kind of core areas that keep uh, popping, uh, popping up. All right. So um, let's have a look. Have we got any uh, questions that have come up that are uh, related to that? While I'm looking for the questions, have a quick look at the, this is a very interesting article from the World Economic Forum. So it's the top 10 skills. Uh, and I thank you for uh, Dell, uh, Mr. Derek, he's my colleague in Bangkok in Thailand. He sent me this one. And I was aware of the one in 2016 that the World Economic Forum did. This one just kind of summarizes the top 10 skills um, that uh, employers um, most look for or, mo or will be looking for in 2025. Um, I guess this um, survey may have been, been done uh, pre-COVID. Pre um, I wonder if it would have changed um, as, a, as a result. But I think you can really grasp um, the kind of skills that are becoming uh, essential. And I wonder how many of those we are currently teaching uh, with our students. Um, if you are uh, teaching any of these uh, skills or supporting your students with these skills, feel free to let me know uh, which ones of those you are already uh, integrating into, into your classrooms. I'm trying to think back to my, my schooling and oh, I, I don't think there was anything particularly visible or explicit in terms of these, these skills. Maybe we pick them up more implicitly, um, but there wasn't, you know, it wasn't made visible by, by the teachers or, you know, there was never sort of feedback given on these areas to help us. Maybe they weren't relevant uh, at that time, maybe more so at university. But I think, I'm not, I'm not sure what you think, but I think now we pick up these skills more on the job when we're when we're working in our uh, in in our roles uh, now which is which is sometimes tough and a, and a challenge for us if we uh, haven't been taught um you know how uh, how to use or develop these uh, these skills okay um a few questions coming in already about global skills how can we arouse real interest in the language with students age 12 to 16? I don't know if that's a global skills question. Um, that may be one about motivation, but um, maybe what I'll show you a little bit later is um, how we can use global skills or global skills lessons, how we can work on maybe the sub skills and how we can make those interesting uh, for our teenage uh, students. What else do we have? Um, how can global skills be integrated in students' performance tasks? Great question. And I think what we will, we will do, what we will address is assessment. And I think hopefully when, when I go into that, that will answer that question. So we'll have a look at things like ongoing uh, formative assessment, maybe assessment for learning uh, as well, uh, how we can uh, help teachers uh, develop step-by-step uh, -step little cycles for assessment or performance tasks, how we can develop maybe can-do statements um, if you are working from um, the CEFR, the Common European Framework, where you have can-do statements for the individual language skills. Um, so like Rona was talking about, so uh, students can talk fluently about uh, relevant topics or students can um, speak about a familiar topic for a one minute. We can also develop can-dos maybe for these uh, global skills as, uh, as, as well. I think once we can break down these skills uh, into um, sub-skills, 
So if we look at something like um, emotional self-regulation, I think when we're talking about assessment and performance tasks, we have to break them down into maybe the sub skills. So like we would do for speaking, reading, writing, and I'll show you some examples of that a bit, a bit later. Um, actually, why don't, why don't I try and show you what I mean now? Let me try and find some example um, of those sub skills. But if we take something like um, emotional uh, self-regulation, um, which is uh, highly connected to uh, socio-emotional uh, learning, which many of you teaching at maybe the primary or pre-primary level are very, uh, very uh, aware of. So here, here's um, an example of how we kind of break down um, these five areas into sub-skills. So for the uh, self-regulation and well-being, these may well be some uh, core uh, sub-skills that we can work on and develop. So when you are developing a performance task, you can have or set a clear objective, language objective, but you also may have some sub-objectives based around your global skill. So for example, in a, in a task, in a group task, where you want them to come up with a, a, a project, for, for, for example, we're not only assessing their, um, uh, their, their language, uh, how well they present, maybe their verbal, nonverbal communication skills, but we can also uh, assess maybe their relationship skills. So as a performance task for this project or presentation, you might make it visible to the students that you're going to assess their relationship, how well they work together, for example, in groups how well they, they deal with uh, uh, conflict, um, for, for example. So when you um, are designing performance tasks, break it down into sub-skills, choose which one you want to focus on. You don't have to go crazy, just choose maybe sort of one sub-skill, make it visible to, to the students, um, and then uh, as a teacher, you can uh, observe uh, as you go through, if you have a criteria, maybe show it to the students as well so they know expectation. And at the end of the performance task, come back to it and give, give feedback on that individual uh, skill, okay? I thought that's a really nice question actually about how, and that really takes us into kind of uh, assessment. Um, particularly when we have those five broad areas, um, so digital literacy, um, uh, the, uh, the well-being, self-regulation, uh, communication collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and the, the other one I've forgotten, help me out. There was one more that I mentioned. It will come back to me in a minute. But anyway, sometimes they're very kind of big and broad, and it's quite difficult to know the how in terms of how do we teach. Um, we know maybe what, what they are, and it sounds very good, but how do we get down into actually teaching uh, and assessing uh, those uh, those skills? Right. Let's have a look at some more questions. How not to waste time selecting videos for my students? Again, that may be a question that may come tomorrow with the visual literacy uh, session. Um, great question from A A Asa. Sorry, sorry for my pronunciation from Asa. Are the global skills linked or separated when it comes to teaching? I hope I have answered that with what I said about um, the assessment. I think now in course books, we're seeing not only language learning outcomes. I think we're also seeing um, competency-based outcomes. So for example, in the teacher's book, you'll see the, the, the learning outcomes, the grammar, what words they're going to learn, but also now we're seeing what kind of competencies, uh, what kind of maybe 21st century skills, uh, and also now what global skills they are going to learn 
with inside a unit, maybe a lesson or even an activity uh, itself. So I would say the best approach, uh, Asa, would be an integrated approach where it's integrated uh, into uh, the curriculum, into uh, your uh, your lessons. Um, and I, I can show you uh, a few uh, a few examples uh, of that uh, as we uh, as we go uh, go through. But I think very much an integrated uh, approach uh, would be uh, would be the way uh, the way forward. Let me see if I have any um, examples. So actually, this one for you for for those of you that are teaching teens, some of you would have watched. Um, our legend, our legendary author, Mr. David uh, Spencer. So he's our gateway, gateway to the world uh, author. And he has designed an updated edition of Gateway, uh, Gateway to the World. And this course integrates um, the socio-emotional uh, learning. So that's linked to that self-regulation and well-being. So in each unit, as I mentioned, there are a dual, a dual learning outcomes. So learning um, language outcomes, but also um, these um, socio-emotional learning outcomes as well. And each unit, if you can read that, uh, have a look. If not, I will I'll read them out. But each unit will focus on one particular subskill of socio-emotional learning. So for example, thinking positively, or participating actively and including others uh, in, a, in, a, in a group work project, whether online or face-to-face, -face. communicating effectively. I love this one, good intellectual and physical balance. Brilliant, that's all to do with, um, with well-being, right? So it's very visible here in the, in the syllabus. And if you can have a course that does that, Many, many now would do, even pre-primary, primary, teenage, adult, they start integrating these elements like we can see here to help you make those baby steps, you and your students towards uh, these global, global skills. And I think it's really uh, important that as teachers, we're not burdened too much. So in terms of separating global skills if we separate them for me that means we sometimes have to do our own research find our own activities our own lessons it's extra work for us in our already busy schedule um, I'm not in favor of that I'm more in favor of an integrated approach where everything's there for you uh, and visible signposted for your students which makes your life um, super, uh, super, super easy. Okay. So lovely, lovely question. Thank you about that. Um, let's have a quick look. What else has popped up before we look at some more examples? So oh, some beautiful names uh, today. Ethelinda, Ethelinda Gijoko, Gijoko. Wow, what a beautiful name. Um, in these uh, skills, do you have any websites or uh, rubrics of these 10 skills? Ah, so let me, yeah, I think you mean the ones from the World Economic uh, Forum. So I think what you can see here, uh, uh, Ethelinda, and uh, as I will um, show you some more examples as, as we go through. So what courses are doing now is that they're integrating, and this is linked to the previous question. Um, they're integrated into, into courses to make your life in, uh, easy. So for example, here, one of those 10 skills we saw from the World Economic Forum uh, would be um, cultural, cultural intelligence or intercultural communication, um, cultural, uh, you may, may hear different different ways of saying it, but um, here we have intercultural competence. So here it's integrated throughout the course books again. So this is an example from a primary, two primary courses. On the left, we have uh, Give Me Five, primary course for Macmillan Education, where I love this one. They have cultural lessons about, wait for it, the UK. 
So they learn all about the UK culture, but they then uh, compare it to their own culture. So that gets them maybe sort of thinking, comparing, contrasting as well, which integrates those kind of critical uh, and thinking type skills uh, as, 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 as well. The one on the right is actually a, a global citizenship um, syllabus which runs through the whole course. Again, it's already made for you. This one is from Global Stage, okay, uh, which is one of our primary, primary courses. All right. If you're, I don't know exactly which of the 10 skills you're looking for, Ethelinda, um, but those frameworks that I told you about. So we have the, um, what did I mention? The UNESCO four pillars. And I'll share this, these with you in a PowerPoint later. Uh, we've got the ATC 21st Century Skill uh, Framework. We've got the uh, Framework for 20 century, 21st Century Skill Learning. All um, come with more information. Many of them come with rubrics uh, as, well, as well. Some of our courses also come with assessment, assessment rubrics. So... What that means is, as I mentioned before, um, there will be uh, support for teachers about how to observe, observe students maybe in groups, whether that's online or, or in face-to-face -face classrooms, uh, and how to um, give them uh, grades for these kinds of skills. Because sometimes it's quite, uh, quite tricky to assess uh, non-language uh, skills. All right, and I'll, I'll, we will talk about that a little bit more um, towards the end. Um, so we've got some other questions coming in as well about yeah, moving online. Uh, it's difficult to monitor yeah the global skills. Yeah, how do we evaluate uh, the global skills? I think particularly if we're looking at something like communication. Uh, and, and collaboration, for for example. But I think um, I think from our experience now that we're building up with these platforms, Zooms, and all these platforms, there is a lot of scope still to do things like project uh, project work, uh, group work uh, as well. And as I mentioned, there's no reason that we can't have other. Uh, assessment uh, focus, so not only language. So it doesn't have to be so advanced. It could be maybe very simple, uh, a three grade uh, assessment. So for example, uh, yep, they did well, they got the skill, or they're nearly there, or needs more work, Some, something, like, something like that. And you don't have to evaluate or assess all all the students just if you are clear about what skill you are focusing on um, for a particular task what global skill remember we talked about the sub skills in your mind you can take a snapshot of maybe maybe one or two groups as they're talking in their breakout room uh, as they're working through their, their their project you don't have to listen in to all of them just get a snapshot but once you've got a snapshot, feedback is also super, super important. OK, and as I mentioned, make it visible uh, that you are going to be focusing on a particular skill and then give give uh, visible feedback on it uh, as as well. OK. OK, and I think we've, we've got lots of more questions on assessment. Um, why? Oh, this is another. Why should I teach global skills in class? I am an English language teacher. I hope by um, coming back to the um, this one, this slide. I hope this gives us more kind of justification. Now. Um, Two things here about why we should teach. I think there are two sides to the uh, to the argument, and it depends a lot on um, dynamics between 
top-down approaches. By top-down, I mean um, government, educational, country or district-wide policy and curriculum and whether they integrate global skills across all subjects, okay? This is more in the mainstream uh, schooling. And then also on the other side, we have another force working upwards. So we have a top down sort of educational policy on global skills. And we also have bottom up teacher engagement. So the teacher skills, knowledge and attitude towards that as well. For mainstream schooling, I would suggest it's heavily linked on the uh, educational policy and, and the curriculum. So if you're working inside the mainstream schooling, this may be a slightly different dynamic as if you were teaching, for example, in a private language school um, where you are not maybe dictated by um, educational uh, policy, um, or, or curriculum. You just follow maybe the syllabus and curriculum of your private language school. But I say to you, why not develop if they're going to be important for students? If it means it's not too much extra work, so like I've showed you, if they're integrated all, already, and it means the students get a wide variety of activities, for example, intercultural competence means they'll learn about different cultures, um, they can do some sharing if you've got a mixed uh, cultural class, brilliant way to, to integrate intercultural competence. That gives so much variety and engagement to the class. I think if you're uh, integrating thinking skills, critical thinking, creativity into your lessons, that can only mean a really good, engaging, fun task when we're challenging uh, our, our students. If you're bringing in creativity to your lessons, that's definitely a bonus um, uh, in terms of variety, in terms of motivation for your, for your students. So I only see it as a, as a positive, really. But as I mentioned, I think if it's integrated, then, then great. If you have to go off and search too much and spend too much time, then I think that's a more of, a, of, of, of an issue. So better you find a course that integrate these uh, types of skill, um, which will save you uh, a lot of time. Okay. Let's have a look. What else have we got coming in? Um, all right. Online class assessment. How can I learn these skills myself? Okay. Well, I'm just having a look through his question. Um, why not tell me yeah, a little bit about what you, uh, about you guys as well? What have you, um, what have you been doing? Sometimes we don't realize we're integrating these, these, these global skills. What about you? Do you have examples, for example, how you are explicitly teaching some of these global skills uh, in your uh, in your day to day teaching? Um, can you give me uh, a few a few examples for those of you maybe that are explicitly uh, uh, teaching or, or aware that you are teaching these global skills? Maybe becoming you're becoming more aware now as a result of this uh, session. Okay, so some of you are teaching, wow, biology topics, connecting classroom programs, okay. Presentations, I think, are fantastic, aren't they, for, for, for a lot of these, especially they have a digital component as well, which will uh, really fire up those digital uh, literacies, okay. Articles about far away countries, even in the global village. Okay, there was a, there was some of some of you mentioned critical thinking, and there was a, there was a brilliant. Um, we had a workshop, didn't we? A presentation in this global festival uh, last week on storytelling, and storytelling is fantastic for for developing thinking skills. For example. 
So those of you aware of uh, Bloom, Bloom's taxonomy, right? We have the different levels of thinking. So from um, what, have, what have we got from uh, uh, our knowledge and understanding, evaluation, uh, and then up, all the way up to kind of, sort of synthesize, uh, synthesizing information, <clears throat> excuse me, and then uh, creating our own, something of our own based on what we learned uh, at the end. So stories are brilliant, brilliant, brilliant for that as well. Likewise, the types of question that we ask in classroom to get our students thinking um, is, is crucial. And those kind of questions, deep, open-ended questions that need discussion uh, or pair work, group work, that's brilliant for getting them thinking. I'm sure you're all doing those kind of tasks uh, as well. That's a brilliant point. Uh, Adrian, thank you, Adrian is actually asking the students about their well-being uh, as well. I, I wonder how you how you do that or how you approach that uh, as well. Maybe not all students want to talk, particularly teens want to open up and talk about their well-being. Uh, but I think maybe opening up a space, having time in your class at the start or at the end to, to talk about it, uh, maybe a little sort of survey or they can rate themselves about how well they're feeling today. Uh, to help you uh, have empathy for 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 your students um, is is crucial. I think that's a really uh, a really nice uh, a nice point. Um, okay, some lovely lovely ideas. So thank you thank you for sharing uh, all of those points. It looks like many of you are integrating uh, many uh, many of these skills uh, already. Really great question here from Natalia Aliani. It's a, it's a beautiful name. Before teaching global skills to students, how can I learn these skills myself? Where do I begin? Really nice question. Um, as yeah, as I mentioned, there are probably three areas for teachers uh, when we talk about maybe a bottom-up approach to, to global skills. So through teacher engagement. So there are there is knowledge. There are knowledge of what these skills uh, are. These skills that we're looking at um, today. So developing that knowledge through um, through sort of key 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 websites. Some of which I mentioned uh, today. I think also through knowledge also comes through teachers' books. So for example, I'm thinking of a course. For example, we have called Global Stage for primary uh, students. Uh, and in the teacher's book, usually before you get into all the lesson notes, there is lots of information about the methodology behind the course, uh, unit walkthroughs, for example. And there's a lot of information there now. For example, in Global Stage, there is multiple pages about, for example, global citizenship. And what exactly that is? What are the sub skills? Um, what is it? What does it mean for our students? What does it mean for us as teachers? How do we go about teaching uh, that uh, in our in, in our classroom? So that's one way is to 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 look at it as well. Yeah, look in the teachers' uh, guides as well. There's often lots of information about you know uh, uh, global citizenship if they integrate that about social emotional learning obviously about communication, collaboration. A lot of courses will have um, uh, a critical thinking syllabus now uh, running through the course uh, as, uh, as, as well. But I would just read, read as much as you can. I mean, the internet is a fantastic place. Build up your, um, your knowledge. In terms of skills in, in teaching, that, that comes with maybe having the right choice of course. Again, if you have a course which integrates these skills um, and it's there for you. So for example, here, here we have an example of a collaborative project, um, which, which is actually a virtual exchange. So again, this is from the Gateway to the World course, where they'll do a collaborative project online or face-to-face, -face, and then they would share uh, their project or exchange it with a country around the world, okay? So again, there are teachers' notes in the teachers' guides about how to set up these projects. 
So there's a lot of support there for your skills uh, as well. So my advice would be to choose a course which is, is heavy on these kind of skills uh, if it's uh, an area that you want to uh, develop. So develop your knowledge online through teachers' books as well. Develop your skills through uh, having a course book that integrates it, lots of lesson support, for example, in the teacher's lesson plan notes about how to do it. Um, and then the third area is attitude as well. So if you're, if you're someone maybe that has a positive attitude towards global skills, then you're much more likely to want to integrate it and help your students and make it visible for your students, right? If you don't think you know, they're important for your English language classroom, fair enough, I, I won't um, comment on that, um, then, then, then so be it, that's, uh, that's okay too. And uh, that's your decision over whether your class um, should or should not um, be, be integrating it. But I say, have a, have a growth mindset, have an have a open, open mind, think about the future, uh, think about uh, approaching uh, your lessons with a, a, a dual approach, you know, language, but also these skills which will be useful for um, professional, personal, and also academic, uh, academic lives, okay? Um, all right, so great question. Wow, this is a good one. How can I measure my students cultural awareness yeah i think that's a really good question so i think what i mentioned one way might be and it's a very challenging one isn't it i think and one way i mentioned earlier so i showed these uh, pages where they learn about different cultures and then they are asked to do a task based on what they learned about the culture so that may well be uh, a way of um, measuring how well they understood uh, the different culture through the, the, these tasks or follow-up tasks on the page. But also a good task would be how well they compare um, somebody else's culture to their own culture. So they might do like a little Venn diagram similarities and differences between the two cultures they may get into groups and discuss or rank different cultural uh, aspects in order of uh, importance for example uh, and get them thinking and challenge in that way so usually with these courses that you can see here there will be follow-up activities based around a uh, cultural uh, di dimension like a subskill of cultural uh, intercultural uh, intelligence or intercultural competence so they'll be working towards some kind of uh, intercultural uh, subskill here as well so follow-up activities uh, in the student book maybe in the workbook are, are there as well um, to uh, dive into the different um, cultural awareness kind of dimensions and, and subskills and that will be um, a way a way to measure it through those uh, through those tasks. Okay. Again, if you wanted to, you could develop very simple rubrics about how well they pick up on a different culture. Again, make it explicit for the student. So we, today we're going to learn about the British culture and um, how or different sports from different uh, or just different traditional sports from different uh, countries and build up awareness of different kind of activities, hobbies, sports. Um, and you can make uh, make them aware of a little kind of rubrics or assessment rubrics at the start about how you're gonna uh, assess them. So you could sort of uh, tell your students, I'm gonna assess you on your knowledge of that country's sports after you've read the text or listened to the text. So I'll assess you on that dimension but also I'm going to assess you on how well you compare different countries to, to your own uh, country in the sports and ho hobbies and how well you express your opinion uh, about that different culture and your own culture. So make it explicit from, from the start. Okay. Uh, right, still lots on assessment. Yes. 
Okay. Let's maybe there's still a lot of questions on uh, assessment. So let me just give you a few other ideas um, about how we might uh, deal uh, with assessment. There are different ways. So you could do performance tasks, as I mentioned before, and you can assess maybe a subskill of any of these global skill areas. Hopefully it's already in your lesson plan if you've got a, a book that integrates these, uh, these skills. Um, so you could do it that way, use little can-do statements, or you could approach it a little bit differently. So maybe assessment for learning, ongoing assessment, maybe through observations, formative assessments. Uh, but with that, um, as teachers, we would need knowledge, right, about what do we observe? So if we're teaching online, how do we observe uh, our students for specific skills in their uh, breakout groups, for, for, for example? Um, and I'll send, there'll be a few links coming after this uh, with, a, with some um, ideas or some websites for some different form, uh, forms of assessment. But I would look at things like assessment for learning. Um, so these have some key kind of step-by-step -step sort of cycle or, or process of steps uh, to go through um, for ongoing assessment. It will help you with um, uh, to assess students through observation, through dialogue with your students, getting feedback from a student. You can get so much um, uh, evidence of learning just by talking to students uh, as well about about their uh, about their learning. If you're looking for a course with assessment for learning, check out Global Stage Primary Course that comes with an assessment for learning handbook. Again, um, as a great question earlier about developing your knowledge of global skills, this will give you knowledge of assessment for learning principles uh, and little processes you go through, uh, which you could also apply for the assessment of global skills, like you would do for any other kind of skill you're assessing uh, in, uh, in class. Um, journals, I know uh, Rona mentioned those as well, and uh, learning portfolios, that's the one I nearly forgot. Learning portfolios also is a great way of developing or um, little assessments. So here students would kind of choose work, or they would come up with evidence of learning. So, for example, you could give them these global skill areas and they have to keep a learning portfolio uh, and show you how their learning is connecting to these skills as, a, as a evidence of learning. And at different points in the course, you can have a maybe one on one discussion or group discussions about those learning portfolios and what skills aside from the language skills they are developing okay so that involved a lot of creativity a lot of critical thinking on their part um, if you're maybe sharing that on a digital platform um, what was the uh, I, I've forgotten there was a wonderful digital platform where you can share um, I'll come back to that one in a minute you can share online on online their work and you can keep it on there uh, as well great way of developing their digital literacy uh, as well so if you're really really keen then learning learning portfolios have a little search around what they are brilliant way for assessing students um not only language but their um global skills as uh, as as well okay um, let me just check if there's anything else I want to say about assessment for you guys. Learning portfolios, yeah, can-do statements uh, I mentioned before. Um, learn, learner reviews. Uh, these are kind of like little one-on-one -on -one chats with students. So whether they're, you know, pre-primary students, you can chat in, you know, L1, or whether they're adults, uh, adult students, have little sort of drop-in sessions with them. Try and get that into your course timetable. Um, if, if you can, or whether they can join class, you know, a couple of minutes early, just so that you can have a quick chat with them. And these are kind of areas that you could you could chat about. Um, you know, are these skills of interest to you? Um, which kind of these skills do you feel that you're good at? Which kind of skills would you want to develop more in the future? And those one-on-one -on -one chats will give you a lot of information. And with that information, you can then 
maybe start integrating um, uh, some of these skills into your class based on the needs uh, of your uh, of your of your students. Okay. All right. I think we have time for a couple of more. Well, that's a good one. Diana says, do lessons about comprehending how fake news mechanisms work or internet ethics belong to go global skills? I think definitely, Diana. Um, I would say that would be a sub-skill of critical thinking um, for a start about uh, weighing up different sources um, and the validity of the source. I think that's a very uh, core sub-skill of critical thinking. Diana, if you're looking for a course that has a, a sub-skills like these, check out a, this one called Skillful, Skillful Second Edition, which actually has a critical thinking syllabus running through it. So each unit, they'll have a look at a sub-skill of critical thinking. And one of them is all about that, assessing uh, the validity of sources, maybe fake news, uh, internet ethics uh, as well. Internet ethics would also come under digital literacy uh, as well. So definitely part of global uh, global skills. Um, about mediation. Okay. Wow. Okay. Loads of questions still coming in. Uh, students. Global skills aim at empowering 21st century students. Uh, what tools can empower teachers? Yes. I hopefully I'll mention that a little bit. Um, I, I think the answer to this question just comes in in terms of the quality of the, the course, in terms of support for teachers. So a lot of a lot of course books that I mentioned will come with a lot of information in the teacher's guide or already to support you. A lot of teachers' guides now would also come with unit by unit um, support. So, for example, if you're, I'm just thinking, teaching primary students and you want to help them with their social emotional learning, self regulation, well being, I'm thinking of a course, um, for example, a course called Share It, uh, is one of our primary courses. And each unit, they will cover a sub skill of social emotional learning. And each unit will give kind of notes and teacher tips about um, how to uh, integrate social emotional learning or different sub skills of social emotional learning. So I think choosing the right uh, course as well would be a, f a fantastic way of um, empowering yourselves uh, as a teacher. Um, as I mentioned at the start, particularly with digital, getting up to date uh, with our skills, our knowledge is super important as well, particularly with digital, that we are uh, digitally literate so that we can kind of compete with our students on an even uh, playing uh, playing field is super, super important as well, uh, isn't it? Um, but, like, but, but like anything, uh, it's a great question about empowering us as teachers, just it's like anything. Read, read around the subject as much as you can. Choose a good course book, um, and then and then try out. Try out in the in the classroom. Try out different practices. Reflect on your uh, practice. Have a growth mindset. Be positive. Keep trying out things. If they work, great. Keep going. If they don't, um, try and adapt and and, and edit. And uh, I think it's uh, global skills are is a really exciting area for us as teachers. To, to, to empower ourselves and I think reading around this topic uh, for research for this session for me is uh, I feel very very empowered in terms of sort of the knowledge now and and skills I could then pass on to other teachers or, or, or students um, all right come on I've got one more question uh, uh, global skills, any course books for global skills for uh, teenagers? Yes, uh, Gateway to the World is a fantastic one for, um, they've got uh, self-regulation um, and uh, well-beings in there. They've got those collaborative projects over so communication and collaboration. Uh, also involves a lot of creativity and critical thinking. Uh, the whole course is built around sort of thinking, better thinking is better learning. So you've got thinking in there as well. So try and gateway to the world um, 
if you're a teenage uh, teacher. Right. So yeah, we're coming coming towards uh, the end um, of the uh, of the hour. Go. I, I, it's such a fantastic topic. This one. Um, to to get into and we could talk uh, a, a long time about it about um, global skills and its its place in uh, English language uh, teaching um, I think for us in the English language teaching industry I think it's an area that we we're going to hear lots more about I think uh, modern course books now you'll find a lot uh, will integrate these kind of skills now you're going to learn a lot as teachers if you're using these kinds kinds of course books. Um, if you're using our course books, then fantastic, and uh, I hope there's a lot of support in there uh, for you uh, as well. Um, I hope this uh, session has been uh, informative. So as we mentioned, I hope um, you've developed your uh, your skills about global skills, maybe your knowledge, uh, but also your attitude now as well to, towards it. And if you're engaged with these global skills, and I'm sure. Uh, your students will be uh, as uh, as well. So good luck, and um, in your quest for global skills. Talking of global skills, Mr. Global himself is back. Hi, Will. Mr. Global, Mr. Global, I love it. Call me that from now on, everybody, please, Mr. Global. <laughs> Can I get you a yeah superhero T-shirt with a big a big G on? Yeah, yeah. I think you need the you need the superhero t-shirt today, John. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. What you had a in a good way, a bombardment of some really interesting questions. Um yeah. and just wanted to say yeah. thanks. You dealt with them, of course. You dealt with them really, really nicely. I think you've covered everything you possibly could have done um in, in an hour on global skills. So thanks from everybody. Thanks so much, John. Our session today is all about global skills and first of all I'm, i guess let's start with tell me what you think global skills are so you've come to a session that's about global skills put in just one idea in the chat box would you about what do you think global skills might be um yeah great thanks they're coming in already look interaction communication Critical thinking skills, yes, yeah, some really life skills, mm, lovely, yes. Knowledge, understanding, technology. Oh, coping mechanism, yes, we definitely need coping me mechanisms, don't we, at the moment. Collaboration, yes. 21st century skills, so we've had global skills, we've had life skills, we've had 21st century skills. Um, intercultural skills, yes, 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 lovely, lots. I'm going to put up one model of what the skills may be. Um, as you know, we have lots of different models of what these skills are, 21st century skills, global skills, life skills. We have the ATC 21st century skill framework. We have the, um, let's have a think, we have the, the FRAM 21st century skill learning, we have the UNESCO four pillars, we have all of these, but what I've got here is a nice summary. Um, let's look, on the left hand side of my screen, we have the C's, communication, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking. So communication and collaboration, that's what this um, session of, this festival of um, talks, presentations, and Q&A sessions is all about, isn't it? Communicating, collaborating. And at the heart of our industry, we're all about communicating, aren't we? Um, creativity and critical thinking. Of course, of course, these are skills that we all need. And as teachers, you need them particularly, but our students also. Um, intercultural competence and citizenship. Um, intercultural competence, working together with people of different cultures and interacting and communicating with them successfully, with respect, in a way that works. Um, really lovely. Citizenship, um, anybody who's teaching teens out there 
knows that citizenship is a huge thing with our teens um, in 2021. Um, teenagers, even more than maybe 10 years ago, are very much global citizens interested in what's happening around the world, interested in not just the surface of things, but actually getting deep and into global um, issues and being global citizens. Really interesting stuff. Um, emotional self-regulation and well-being. We, obviously, we're going to look at all of these in a bit more detail, but just looking after ourselves. Um, I mean, it's tough, isn't it, at the moment? We're looking after groups of students and but actually we're trying to look after ourselves at the same time and we're all going through turbulent times Susanna makes a point that is it more appropriate to say multicultural competence than intercultural competence um sure but i think um here we're talking about intercultural in terms of how different cultures interact rather than clash so how students work their culture with other cultures but you're right, Susanna, often we are not just working with somebody from one other culture, we're very much multicultural. And one of the joys of being part of the UK ELT industry is that in UK schools, we have students come to the UK to study and you walk into a classroom and typically you have students from all around the world, a typical school in London would have around 30 nationalities at any one time. I mean, really fabulous. Um, digital literacy. Well, I think we've all learned this year, haven't we, that we have to be digitally literate. Um, even the teacher who was very much um, whiteboard and pen and no technology in the classroom has had to learn quickly that we Zoom or we don't teach, you know, so yes, Absolutely. And as Jenna uh, Simonia says, yes, oof. I mean, oof, it's been definitely a lot of oof this year, hasn't it? I'm going to show you another list of skills. And these are skills that come from the World Economic Forum. There was an initial list in 2016. This is the 2020 list. Um, now, take a look at this. These are the top 10 skills of 2025. So we've got our crystal balls out. We're looking into the future. In fact, trend spotters and trend forecasters have looked into the future. These are the top 10 skills that they think employers will be looking for from their employees in 2025. Now, um, they're broken down four different color buttons, problem solving, self-management, working with people, um, technology. I kind of think we're already in the future because this looks like the top 10 skills that people want now from employees. I just want you to have a quick look with your English teacher hat on. There are 10 things there. How many of them are important to you in your job as a teacher? In your role as a teacher, how many of these 10 points are important to you? I'm going to give you a quick minute to think, and I'm going to have a little sip of coffee while you while you look. <laughs> There's no fooling you, is there? All of them, all of them, all of them. Yes. My somebody didn't get the question. The question was how many of these top ten skills are important to you to be able to deliver your. Um, to deliver in your role as a teacher all of them almost all of them pretty much yeah definitely resilience stress tolerance and flexibility definitely flexibility we're right we're fully flexible at Macmillan at the moment as you know um yeah all of them some are saying less some are saying five um i think it really depends on your situation on your context on your local context on the type of school that you're in and the type of resources that you have available to you but i think as a teacher i would use most of these um, but then if we go beyond teaching if we think about other jobs that we know 
already so many jobs that we know need these things. They're all very important. Yeah, Tatiana is saying programming is not that important as a teacher. It's true. But I know lots of teachers who do create little hot potato um, apps and create lots of little nice um, bits of technology for their students. So depending on who we are, I guess. So anyway, I'm getting to a point with all of this. And the point really is we need these now. Our students need them now. And what's wonderful is that these global skills have found their way into our course books and they've found their way into our classroom. So now that they're in our classrooms, what I'm going to ask you is a question that I get asked quite a lot, actually, whenever I talk about skills, is I'm an English teacher. Why do I have to teach global skills in my classroom? Why is this important? I wonder if you can have a think about that and let me know. Drop a message into the chat box. As English teachers, why is it important that we teach global skills? We don't teach robots. I love it. Yes. Um, for the future, yeah. Oh, I like it. Wahiba, the world is becoming a small village, isn't it just? Isn't it just? Everybody's so much closer than before. To prepare students for life beyond classroom, yeah, because of globalization, global citizens. Yes, because everybody needs them. Yeah, it's true. Um, what I'm really pleased to see is nobody is saying we teach these because we've been told we have to teach them, which I have seen, trust me. Um, and depending on where you teach or who is setting the curriculum or deciding on what you teach, um, of course, the, if you're talking uh, government level or Ministry of Education level, then you probably don't have much determination as to where the curriculum is going and what's in the curriculum, and this will probably be in there. Um, but uh, Safar says hello from Egypt. Hello back to you, Safar. Look, when I think about um, these skills, what I look at is a list of things that, yes, they're important global skills, but they're a list of things that I would like my students to be able to do in English. Um, and if my students are able to do these in English, just fab. You know, I mean, this is great. We're going beyond, as you say, teaching English. We teach people. Our subject is English. But we're no longer in those days of teaching people to, you know, buy a ticket at the train station, order two kilos of, of apples and see what's for lunch on the menu. This is not what English is about, is it? English is about our future and our careers and how we develop from this. Okay, so, um, very quick question while I'm here. Oh, who are you teaching? Are you teaching adults, teens, um, primary, pre-primary? Let's have a quick look. We have lots of teens, I see. Adults, young adults, late teens. Teens, yeah, late teens. Fab. Okay. A good mix, 16 to 17, primary adults. Wow, that's a good mix. A rural agricultural school, that's fantastic. How exciting. Kids and teens, secondary. Okay, so what I want to do is whip you through some examples of um, getting these types of skills into the classroom. Um, before I do that, I just um, obviously at any point you're free to ask questions. It's a Q&A session, not a presentation session. So by all means, ask questions in the chat box. Um, either I'll spot them or Federica will spot them. OK, so let's have a look at communication and collaboration. OK, so this communication and collaboration, definitely 21st century skills. Both of them definitely um, 
global skills, life skills, um, communication and collaboration. How wonderful. So we have two projects here, uh, two um, tasks here. One of them is a collaborative project and the other is a speaking activity. The collaborative project um, is from um, a wonderful new book called Gateway to the World. I'm sure many of you know Gateway and the wonderful Gateway series for teens. Fabulous series, one of my favorite books written by the just fantastic Dave Spencer. Um, I'm sure everybody knows Dave. Yes, Emily knows Dave there, fantastic. So Dave has um, upgraded Gateway to Gateway to the World. Um, before I look at that, oh yeah, that's okay. I'm just gonna click yes. Um, so, um, for, so for this book here where we have a wonderful collaborative project, um, one thing that we can see is um, the importance of collaboration. And, I'm going to just think about other books. When we look at, v, at very young learners, our VYLs, we have wonderful books like um, Wheels, for example, the Wheels series, so Mimi's Wheel, Ferris Wheel. And in this book, even at pre-primary age, we have wonderful collaboration, collaborative projects where students are encouraged to work together um, on collaborative projects. Um, we also have um, lovely collaborative projects in things like Speak Your Mind, um, Language Hub. We have these great collaborative projects. And working together is really, really important, isn't it? Um, Share It, which is a lovely book for young learners. We have some wonderful collaborative projects there. Um, collaboration is super important, isn't it? And encouraging our students to work together very important. I'm wondering um, if you're having the same issue in your country that we have in the UK, which is where um, where our um, young learners or teens in particular are, wor are, are working together on collaborative projects, but they're not sitting next to any to each other anymore, and so actually encouraging them to work together is demanding a whole new set of skills from teachers and one thing that makes collaboration easier even when students aren't sat next to each other is that they um is that we have wonderful materials and the materials really are designed to engage students and to get them working together um, but you need to be smart as teachers and think about how am I encouraging my students to work together on projects? And one thing that's difficult with breakout rooms is we can't spend our time in breakout rooms in the same way that we could in a classroom. We can't, in a classroom, we can see that something's not happening right over there and we can go and solve it. And we can see that this group isn't talking. Um, one thing that I have seen um, a wonderful teacher do in the UK, and I think this is one of the loveliest things I've seen in breakout rooms, really, is um, at the beginning of class, she gives students um, the option of breakout room type A, type B, and type C. And students say, according to how they're feeling that day, whether they want to go into a type A, a type B, or a type C breakout room. And she has all three type breakout rooms in her class. And a type A breakout room is for big groups who want to chat a lot and it's a noisy breakout room. And that's for some students. Type B is a quieter breakout room where students still work in groups, but it's a bit quieter and it's a bit more studious. And type C classroom uh, breakout room is for the students who just want to work with a friend. They 
they're having a tough day they're not maybe not natural communicators they don't want like the noise they don't work well in the noise and they just want a quiet room in which to work with a friend on the collaborative project and giving them abc option means that we're allowing the students that wonderful skill of self-determination we're giving i mean it's a really lovely thing isn't it if we think you know students work well when they're able to make choices but also we're looking to get them to think what's right for me today what do i want today so that's a really lovely way of getting people to co collaborate um yeah um yeah, Axana teen teenagers nowadays don't like to work together. Um, and they like to talk in their own language. Yeah, L1's a problem. Students like group work. Some do, some don't, right? We're never going to find the perfect class of everybody likes to work together. The best you can hope for is really engaging materials that are going to really pull your students um, into a classroom that they really, into a project that they really want to get their teeth into. So I'm going to um, tell you about this other speaking activity here. Now this speaking activity here, the one in blue, this is from Speak Your Mind. Um, and here we have um, a pair activity followed by a group speaking activity. Now, in the pair activity, we're role playing. Um, we're role playing. What? Why are we role playing? Do you think? What's the point of role playing? I know they do love role play, Valentina. Absolutely. But Susan is on the money there. It builds confidence. Yes. So we get them to role play to build confidence. Um, Teens, young adults really love it. Um, I it, I feel like I can give an opinion because it's not necessarily my opinion. And as you can see, this box from uh, this blue box from Speak Your Mind is a confident communicator activity. And confident communicators is what we're looking for, isn't isn't it? We're looking to really build student confidence with what we're teaching um yeah um mary christine has a question of um about there's so many speaking activities in the books that students are almost forced to say something um about themselves and sometimes students don't even want to go as far as saying what their favorite color is um it's a good point mary christine some students uh, we have to remember that in l1 students may not be natural sharers and talkers and we can't force them to do that in l2 um but you're right if students won't say what their favorite color is um maybe we can give them a character in a role play and in this role play for example um here i'm imagining that i'm a well-known music vlogger or i'm a famous skateboarding vlogger and so students are able to put themselves in someone else's shoes and decide you know what would this person think what would this person do what would this person's favorite color be and then we're not asking them to share about themselves are we um obviously if we're asking students to share something about themselves we have to share about ourselves first because as you know we are always leading by example in the classroom. So before I ask you what your favorite color is, I'm going to tell you what mine is and you can guess what my favorite color is. And it's of course blue. Um, but you know, never expect your students to tell you something that you're not willing to tell them about yourself. It's a good place to start. I'm going to switch us to another slide here. Um, this slide is all about emotional self-regulation and well-being um sel i'm sure everybody is um familiar with sel and omar's question here is about 
introverted students and what we can do with introverted students. Um, Omar, we'll talk about that as part of this, but also we have some ideas about introverted students as well. Um, look, we have SEL. I don't know um, how many of you know SEL, or, but I'm sure many of you do. Social and emotional learning. If you go back into the Macmillan archive, the Advancing Learning webinar archive, you'll find in there a really wonderful webinar from Carol Reed. I'm sure many of you know Carol Reed um, as the um, primer, pre-primary superstar author that she is. She has some wonderful webinars, but this one about social and emotional learning in the pre-primary classroom and the primary classroom, really fab. Yes, you're right, Amalia. Carol is the author of Mean is, mean is Real. Yes. So have a look in the Advancing Learning webinar um, archive. I'm sure Federica could pop up a link for us there. But anyway, here we have um, social and emotional learning as part of developing a student's well being and self regulation, emotional self regulation. And much of this is covered in our classroom, isn't it? We think about SEL as being something for younger learners, but actually um, we're all on our social and emotional journey, uh, learning journey, aren't we? This is not just a kid's thing. This is for all of us. Um, you know, we all learn better when we're in a warm and friendly environment. We all learn better when the teacher is modeling and giving us examples. Um, we all get better results when we have praise, when we're getting positive feedback, no matter how old or young we are. Um, social and emotional learning is through our course books. And it's very interesting to look at um, something like the wheels series for example where pre-primary we have this nice hop on hop off style of learning where we're focusing on stories and values lessons that talk to us about managing our emotions managing our behavior um, making um, good choices good decisions um, knowing what we're good at um, listening to people and understanding them all of this from wheels at a very young age all the way through to global stage for example which is a young learner series in global stage we have some lovely social and emotional learning lessons in there um, where students are able to um, do projects under the heading of thinking together or thinking it over where they start to think about this. Um, yes, Amalia, encourage your small kids in kindergarten with stickers. I love it. I love it. Positive, positive encouragement, you know, creating a positive place. And, and that's our role as teachers all the way through, isn't it? We're creating a positive space for our students. And yeah, Wahiba SEL does start in the family. Um, but as we know, it doesn't end in the family. It absolutely has to join us um, in the classroom as well. Um, in um, something like Speak Your Mind, for example, one nice thing about Speak Your Mind, it's, an, it's a young adult series. Um, and it's really focusing on prepping students for an international workplace or an international study place or speaking English. Um, in a modern environment. One of the nice things is it, so the book, it, it, it's like this connection between the real world and the classroom for the students, really lovely book, but it, it has a series of lessons all the way through, language and life, they're called. And what they do is they encourage students to consider other people's points of view. And this is really interesting, isn't it? So, in terms of our social and emotional learning, if we can encourage our students to think, what are other people thinking? That's just really lovely. 
And I think, I don't know how many of you use dice in the classroom, you know, six sides, dice. Um, I make my own dice. And when I'm talking about a topic or a theme or an issue or a question with students, what's really lovely is to put stickers on the dice and get students to write on them the names of six people that they know. So it could be my young cousin, my little brother, my grandmother, um, my teacher, my um, the man who drives the bus to school. And we just put these stickers on the dice or you download a model to make a dice. And as we roll the dice, we can start to think, what does this person think about this topic? So as we go through our books and we have these wonderful entrance entrance pages to these openings to our lessons where we're activating students um, schemata about the topic that's coming up what's really nice is to get them to roll the dice and not don't tell me what you think but tell me what do you think your little brother thinks about this what do you think your grandma thinks about um you know the olympic games what do you think your next door neighbor thinks about the environment i don't know. lots of room you know what what would a teacher think about it what what does the man who drives the bus drives the bus think about the environment really lovely way of getting students to um think about things from a different point of view and as i said speak your mind wonderful book for that um I'm going to have a quick look with you at something that is all about intercultural competence. And remember our um, colleague earlier who said maybe this should be multicultural competence. You know, there's an argument both ways. Um, for the sake of continuity, we're going to call it intercultural com competence today. Um, and here on the left hand side, we have a nice lesson. And this is from Give Me Five. Give Me Five, lovely six level primary series, um, 21st century skills all the way through. Really fab. Um, um, Give Me Five, it has really nice video lessons, pushing creative critical thinking. But here we're looking at intercultural competence. And intercultural competence here, the lesson is, you can see I'm talking about this lesson at Spring Hill School. And Spring Hill School, this is a lesson that is culture, culture around the world, Ireland. And yes, Elena, I absolutely agree with you. Give Me Five is a great book. <laughs> but I would agree, wouldn't I? Of course. So culture around the world, Ireland. And this is a really lovely lesson. Um, we're talking about schools in Ireland and we're talking about um, the games that students play at school, the sports they play at school. And we're talking about um, how that compares to the sports that students play in your own country and the after school activities. OK, so. We learn about a new um, a new culture we're looking at ireland here greetings from dublin hello susan you can tell us all about um, what happens at spring hill school i'm sure so look we we're learning about school in ireland and then at the bottom of the page our next task is not just to learn about the school um christina's book is called give me five um we're not just learning about ireland we're taking what we've learned about Ireland and we're comparing it to where we are now, where we are studying. So whether we're in Brazil or in Colombia or in um, Ecuador or Oman or Kuwait or Russia or Ukraine or wherever we may be, we're comparing this with our own school, with our own experience of life. One thing that I've seen really lovely in a classroom is a teacher who has um, grown uh, across a wall a series of um if you know venn diagrams and a series of venn diagrams where 
the students are looking at how the two schools overlap. Oh, we've changed slide there. There we go, back to here. So where there's an overlap between this culture that I've just learned about and my own culture, and that space in the middle is where we're, what we're really interested in. Because um, intercultural um, awareness and intercultural communication doesn't come just from knowing about the other culture. It comes from knowing what we share in common and what wonderful things are different in the two cultures. Um, really lovely. I'm a big fan of, of um, Venn diagrams in the multicultural classroom. If you have um, students from different um, countries in your classroom, that's a really lovely thing to do. You know, draw Venn diagrams of what's different and what, what you have in common. Students who can find common ground, just beautiful, really lovely. Anyway, so intercultural competence is really important. One question we get asked a lot is, how do we measure a student's progress in something like intercultural competence? How do we do that? What do you think? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah, assessment, but how? How do we assess a student's level of intercultural competence? What do you think? Any ideas? Have a quick think about it. Mm, Katia giving presentations, I like it. And essay case examples where they can explain it. Yeah. Speaking about it, like, oh, yeah, I think so. A lot of these things, a lot of global skills are very difficult to measure, aren't they? Um, but I think if we think about things um, like um, portfolios, for example, having a portfolio of work that a student completes, obviously in English, using the target language that they've been developing in that moment leading up or in that unit leading up to that portfolio really lovely develop a portfolio of work and in there you can use the collaborative projects from your course book as part of that portfolio of work um, now omar said earlier um what do we do with students who don't who are a bit introvert and um joanne has come up with a one minute speech here and i think those two are quite connected aren't they because um in our online world not as as omar says some students are introverts and they don't want to speak but we would like to hear them but what's wrong with getting students to record themselves speaking so that we can hear um what they have to say on a subject they share it with us but they're not forced to share it with the whole class. Um, and that again, so a recording of their presentation as opposed to being forced to stand up in front of the class and speak is also a very acceptable part of a portfolio, I think, and really lovely. Um, so the other thing that we can do for assessment, we have wonderful things like can-do statements, and a lot of our courses in the Teachers Resource Centre, you'll find things like can-do statements. Um, and we can have some nice one-to-one -one reviews with our students, can't we? Um, one of the nice things with one-to-one -one reviews, if you are using a modern course like something like Speak Your Mind, for example, you are able to, um, if your students have been working on the digital book while you've been working, online you're able to see their progress through that if they're working on the app which is the extra practice on their phone if they've been doing that on their app you can see the progress of that so um all of this um all of the options that are available to us with modern courses and with um contemporary courses like speak your mind give me five and the wheel series share it these are all lovely ways to really um have reviews that work because we're collecting data about the students progress as we go all right so enough about assessment which app um susanna when if you have um, a look at our catalog i'm sure um 
Francesca, um, sorry, Federica can give us a link to the catalogue. But on in our catalogue, you'll see um, a lot of our course books come with an app or they come with the Navio app. And on there, that's um, sometimes we use it in class, but sometimes we use it in um, as um, asynchronous self-study, which is really nice. Um, yeah, Murat, the topic of intercultural competence, more and more important over the past years, globalization, worldwide contacts between companies, organizations, individuals. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the lovely things um, through many of our courses, and one thing that I really love is that we have authentic accents. So our accents aren't always people speaking British English or American English, but you know, we'll find international accents in some of the books as well, particularly something like Speak Your Mind or Language Hub will get really nice accents in there that give students that real experience of speaking English on a global stage. And talking of global stage, um, the book Global Stage clearly um, does this really, really well for young learners. If you have young learners, it's a great thing. Um, I'm going to move on from this and um, I want to show you very quickly um, some um, learner profiles here. Let's not do that. Let's take a look here. Um, so this is from Story Central. Um, I don't know if any of you know Story Central as a book. Do you know it? Students are confused when they listen to Australian English. I, I don't know. We all we all get used to different kinds of accents, don't we? Yes, Zara, this is a great book. Yes, Story Central, really lovely. Um, Story Central gives us this like story-based methodology. Um, it's a different um, methodology, but what's really lovely is it's encouraging creativity from students and it's encouraging students to think a little bit more critically about what's happening here. Um, and um, yeah, and as you can see, we have this um, on the right hand side of the screen here, this Bloom's taxonomy, which takes us from our basic level of understanding information through um, transforming that information into generating new ideas. And if you look at those verbs in there, recalling, symbolizing, categorizing, at a higher level, inducing, applying, and analyzing, and at that very high level of generating new ideas, brainstorming, synthesizing, yeah, the book is called Story Central. Um, I think a couple of you have missed it. Um, so what's nice about this, this course, this story-based course, is we take students on a journey from not from basic just understanding the story through to being able to produce their own. Really lovely. Um, Willby wants to know, is the book digital? All of the books that I'm showing you today have um, some lovely, fully flexible solutions that really work for what, however you're teaching. So whether you're teaching face-to-face, um, -face, whether you're teaching online, or whether you're teaching um, a blended or hybrid course, we have these books here. So yeah, um, Federica is sending you over there to the course information if you have a look at that link there that will tell you more about the course really lovely really lovely so um i'm going to take us back to um social and emotional learning a little bit um and i want to think about um how you know how do you create that environment that your students want to learn in? Um, so I'm interested from you guys to know, you know, however old your students are, how do you create an environment that makes them want to learn? Tell me, how do you make that environment, particularly if you're teaching online, how do you create a nice working environment? 
Oh, lovely. I'm their friend and they're mine, Susanna. Lovely. Um, showing passion. Yes. Confidence environment. Be patient. Use their names. Use their names. It's one of the first things we learn on, on our CELTA course, isn't it? Um, remember your students' names and use them. So important. Yeah. Um, with games, create a comfortable atmosphere. Um, Felicita, let them choose topics. I love that. I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to stick with that for a minute because that's really interesting. Let your students choose their topic. Um, I need a bit of lubrication for my throat, I'm sorry. Um, look, I, I have this, and in fact, this is a question that I wanted to ask you about what you thought about this. Um, I get this quite a lot with teachers who say to me, look, I have a class of teens. They're all teenagers. They love the communication part of the lesson. They love chatting. They're a very chatty class. They like that. They like the fun stuff. They like make, doing presentations and project work. But what I can't get them to do is grammar. And they're not interested in learning new grammar. And I'm wondering, what do you think about that? Um, is it important for them to learn the grammar? And how do we get teens to learn the, the grammar? Susan, I like that. Give them a selection of topics, allow them to vote on the order. Um, through Kahoot, in context, in context. Dan Nelly, in context, yes. Yes, yes, yes. So through games, but in context. Um, and this is one thing that I'm a really big fan of is um, grammar in context, but also allowing students a bit of self-determination. And one thing that I that we know will stop learning dead in its tracks is when the teacher says, right, now we're going to do some grammar. And everybody goes, and nobody wants to do it. So um, if we think about um, our 21st century skills, you know, so we're thinking about things like, um, and we know that our students do these things and they enjoy these things. So if I think about what my, my teens have enjoyed, they've enjoyed project work where they've had to solve a problem and think creatively and use their brains a bit, do a bit of critical thinking, work together, take responsibility for the results. Um, and I think if we approach the grammar from that angle as well, so, you know, um, something like Speak Your Mind or Global Stage, for example, a very inductive approach to grammar. It's not the teacher standing at the board explaining this is the grammar and drawing lines and underlining and all of that stuff. It's not grammar presentation. It's inductive, guided discovery. We're getting students to work the grammar out for themselves. What we know about teens is they like to do things together because they feel more comfortable doing it together. So I, for those schools who say to me, how do I get my teens to learn grammar? I just say, make it a project like every project that they enjoy. Don't give it that title of grammar. Use the inductive approach that's in the course book. And then allow them the creativity to achieve the result themselves. Give them positive encouragement. Give them lots of feedback. But um, the main thing is, allow them a little bit of self-direction work it out for themselves um now where carol said give them a choice and let them let them um choose this is the number one way to work with teenagers isn't it but it's also the number one way to work with young adults too and i think as kids get more sophisticated even with primary kids it can work too um we all know um, if any of you are parents, and I'm sure many of you are parents, if we say to the kids, no TV, they're just going to want to watch TV. But if they know that TV is allowed sometimes and not allowed at other times, 
they're more willing to accept the moments without TV because they know that a TV moment is coming up soon. So if you have plenty of fun, engaging activities in your class, the teacher books are full of them for all of our courses. Extensions, the course books themselves are full of them. Lots of fun, engaging activities for students. If they know that these are always coming up, and we can say to them, okay, guys, we need to knuckle down a little bit now and we're going to do something that's a bit more brain power. They'll be okay with it because they know the good stuff's coming up later, right? But allow students self-determination, you know. Teenagers, we have this bit that was going to take a bit of time and a bit of effort. Do you want to do it now or do you want to do it after lunch? It's up to you guys. What do you want to do? Allow them to decide it doesn't hurt, right? Um, but yeah, engage students all the way through. I'm going to go back up to that top list here. So here we are, back to that list of the top 10 skills at 25. Um, Brenda, how can we teach if we only have two hours a week per group? What would be the most important theme for 12 and 13 year old students? Um, well, how can we teach if we only have two hours a week per group? We teach slowly. And we hope that we can give them some engaging asynchronous stuff that's going to keep them working in between lessons. But what's the most important theme for 12 and 13 year olds? Um, I'm going to ask you guys, what do you think? What are the most important themes for 12 and 13 year old students, do you think? Pop it in the chat box. What's the most important theme for 12 and 13 year olds? TikTok. Fashion, food, music, friendship, anything social, feelings, video games, tech, YouTube, their peers, their world, sports, hobby, friendship. Yes, right. Million topics. But ultimately, the topic you choose is the topic for your students, isn't it? Unfortunately, we can't say this is the topic that works for all 12 and 13 year olds because he does a biography. That's lovely. I like that. Superheroes. I'd go to a superhero lesson any day. I'd be happy with that. Celebrities less so, I think. Um, but, you know, tech. But ultimately, know your students. And it goes back to, um, I can't remember who said it at the beginning. Maybe it was Susanna. But, um, you know, remember, we don't teach robots. We teach humans. And knowing who they are, knowing more than their names, knowing who are these students and teaching subjects that interest them is really important, isn't it? It's the best thing we can do. Teach those students using a subject that interests them. Now, different things will interest different students. Luckily, modern course books really do help us um, because they have some fairly good broad sweep of topics that interest the target age group. So um, one thing that I love about um, Language Hub, for example, I love it about Global Stage, about Wheels. These are books that have a topic syllabus that is really nice. It's, we're beyond you know, the days of, um, you know, if we're teaching adults, we're no longer talking about our favorite flamenco dancer and um, singing Shania Twain and all clapping in the class. We're talking about subjects that students are engaged in, um, particularly if you're teaching teens or young adults. It's really good to get a great course book um, like, for example, Speak Your Mind, where you have um, a topic syllabus that says, you know what, guys, I know your English isn't as good as you want it to be at the moment, and we're working on that. But we also recognise that you're not stupid, that you do have opinions, and that you're interested in the world around you. And that's the best thing we can do for students, isn't it? Treat them in our English lessons to subjects and topics that appeal to them in their in their everyday world. I mean, absolutely, in their everyday lives. So we're coming to the end, and I'm wondering if we have any more questions coming in. Um, I feel like I'm throwing lots of ideas at you. How are you getting on 
there. Any questions, anybody? Um, yes, we'll be in Ivory. Knowing students' interest is very good. It's essential, isn't it? Yeah. We need to be psychologists. Um, we don't, but we need to know how people think, right? Um, well, Heba, how can we help them to think in the language they use? Um, a lot of the course books these days are designed to encourage critical thinking in that language. But you're right. A lot of students, particularly at lower levels, will be thinking in one language and speaking in another. But um, yes, um, getting your students thinking in English, um, it's a breakthrough moment, isn't it? How do we teach students to read in English? Um, well, unfortunately, we don't teach students to read in isolation of anything else, do we? We teach them um, English as a language. Reading is part of that. Um, but yes, um, the reading lessons for youngsters, for example, in things like um, Story Central, things like Share It, things like Give Me Five, really lovely, really lovely reading lessons. But the main way to get students to read in English is give them something they want to read. Um, don't force your taste in books or your taste in literature onto students. Let them tell you what they like and make the effort to go out and find it because you will be rewarded for giving your students what they like. Um, Mickey says we mentioned different accents in the world. American English and British English are very different from us with vocab, um, movie theatre and cinema, prom, spelling, grammar. Um, is it a good idea to stick to either of them or learn the differences? I think, look, ultimately learn the English that is appropriate to your region. If you're in Latin America, for example, American English may be more important. If you're in Europe, British English may be more important. But learn the language that is or learn the version that's right for you but ultimately how fascinating and students love it they love that we have a pavement in england and a sidewalk in america and that in england we put our suitcases in the boot of the car and in america they put the suitcases in the trunk i mean english is lovely and um students one way to get students fascinated about a language is to show them these lovely things like the differences between American and British English. Really nice. Um, teaching kids critical thinking in kindergarten. All I can say to you is, Amalia, if you want to teach critical thinking skills in kindergarten, please get a copy of um, Ferris Wheel or Mimi's Wheel. It's a course by Carol Reed, and you will find that Carol just does exactly what you need for your kindergarten kids in that book um really lovely 